Welcome to the conversation. I'm Paul Grandal, the director of the New York State Writers Institute. We're really excited with today's guest because he is a University at Albany alumnus. We're very proud of Nana. How are you doing, Nana? Hey, I'm, I'm doing okay, hanging in there. I'm happy to be here today. This is a weird, weird time. I mean, how are you just coping with this quarantine and lockdown? And <laughs> um, Badly, no. Sometimes it's uh, rough. Uh, I'm trying to take it a day at a time. Uh, I'm focusing on um, what I can do in the moment that I am. And uh, I've tried to disengage from some of the daily updates of you know, how brutal everything is everywhere. Um, but yeah, I've been trying to just stay sort of in the moment and be around um, people that I feel comfortable with and people that make me feel sort of safe. And that's really all I can do, you know, but I, I have felt some, excuse me, some, you know, solace in connecting, whether through Zoom or phone with my friends and sort of getting more into different crafts, like I'm learning photography and I've started like to sort of dive into that just through practice and YouTube tutorials and so that kind of thing. But for the most part, I'm really just taking a day at a time. And do you know anyone, you know, close to you or personally who's been affected by this? Uh... Yeah, I do know. I mean, I, like I said, I'm, I live right outside the city and I've, you know, lived in the city. Um, so it's where we're hit very hard. And my mom had the virus and is recovering now. So very, very close to me. Um, people are being affected. Uh, and so it's... Um, it's very much not like a theoretical issue for me, and I think for a lot of people right now. So your your award winning acclaimed book uh, collection, Friday Black, you know, deals a lot with race and 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 racism. Yes. And I interviewed some uh, faculty at the School of Public Health who are now working on a study with the State Department of Health on the disproportionate effect of particularly Latino and African American communities. Yes. Hitting black people two or three times more. Yeah. Think about that. Are you angry about that? Are you researching about it or? I'm thinking about it and I am for sure um, dismayed by it. Angry and sort of, I don't know, depressed about it, but because of how unsurprising it is really. Um, like I said, I live in a, my apartment in the Bronx and I think between the Bronx and Queens, like your chances of, of it going poorly for you are like more astronomically higher than anywhere else right now. And, um, you know, the, the issues that we're talking that, that I think my work is often concerned with and people who deal with race, you know, these aren't just because we, we're not just complaining to complain, you know, we aren't uh, talking about these issues because it's some kind of vanity for many of us. These issues, you know, are, always, always, always manifesting and they become obvious in these sort of stark pandemics uh, or, but they were already obvious, you know, we already knew the, the numbers about women's likelihood of dying in childbirth if they're black versus if they're not black. <clears throat> we already knew that uh, the medical field, like all other fields were deeply biased. And so we already knew that there were implications and connections between poverty and uh and health and well-being so you know these when we say something is systemic when we say racism systemic we means like it's systemic meaning it, it uh it affects almost all facets of existing in society and so um it's dismaying but it's also sort of what we should have kind of expected and seen coming in a lot of ways do you feel or are you currently working on something that's you know, feeding off this pandemic or somehow yeah. spurred by or inspired because I've been interviewing different writers and, and some are really particularly poets writing poems about the coronavirus pandemic. Other yeah. people, writers I talk to myself included, feel like you were saying before, kind of overwhelmed, kind of, mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm on top of my game right now just because it's just such a strange, you know, yeah. a strange thing. And mainly I'm, I'm not as productive because I'm trying to touch base with our team, you know, we, we can't come into our office at the Writers Institute. Our students that we work with are now scattered at home and in challenging situations. So 
Right. Yeah, I find it hard to be productive, but other writers say, this is what I always, I, I'm always quarantined and isolated as a writer. So how have you personally been, you know, creatively responding to this? Or yeah, I can't imagine anyone just being like unaffected. <clears throat> Even if you quarantine and isolate as a writer, you know, that's different when that's happening and people like, are dying by the thousands every day um, from a specific issue that you're aware of. I, at first I, I did feel very sort of um, locked up. And I mean, I wasn't even sort of thinking so much about trying to produce. I was just sort of thinking about, not even thinking about, but spiraling through my own anxiety. Um, I think that the last couple of weeks, though, I have sort of gotten a, a space in something, not clarity, but something like acceptance of the circumstance that has allowed me to sort of try to write stuff and not necessarily things that are directly um, about the pandemic and the virus, but sometimes they are. I've had someone who actually um, sort of solicited me to write a uh, like thousand word story that had to deal directly with sort of the news headlines now. And I usually resist that kind of thing and I haven't written that kind of thing prior. That is something for a quick turnaround. I kind of was like, you know, my fiction isn't like that. And I decided, you know what, I can try something new. It might, it might be helpful or valuable to just push through and try to write something in this moment and that's of this moment. Because it which is again very different for me. Most of my stories I sit on for, you know, four or five, six years. I was revising a story this morning that I've been working on since at least 2016. Um, so it's very different for me. But I, I have started diving into some stories, and I'm trying to. I'm just trying to do something that feels generative, um, and it's not always necessarily connected to <clears throat> the virus per se, but it is connected to a feeling that is um, that sort of dread, worry, or also maybe sort of sometimes grace and gratitude that we, that, that we have available to us. So I am sort of starting to peek my head into my writing again. And last week or two, I've been sort of back in it a little bit. I, I know you craft it because we are grateful when you came back to uh, your alma mater, University at Albany, you visited uh, English class. You were an English major, Ed Schwarzschild was also connected to the Writers Institute. He's a fellow and you did an event with us and it was great to have you back on campus. Um, I know you've been teaching uh, often and this is now the first time you're not teaching. What, what's that like? It's, um, I mean, now it seems like I picked a good year to not be doing it. Um, right. It's, uh, it's really, uh, I feel the lack, you know, I miss the, the atmosphere, I miss the classroom. My classes, I'm one of those people who I've been lucky enough that I'm really not jaded about teaching. I love teaching. I think it's a, a calling and, a, um, you know, um, it's something I love to do just as much maybe as writing, you know, something that I think is connected to like purpose for me. And to not have it so suddenly after being literally in the academic space since 2009, you know, straight, I had one semester, I think, actually, I didn't teach physically in a classroom space, or maybe one semester I, in, in, the, in the last 10 years. But I think I had an online class even then. Um, and I was teaching like at the Y in Syracuse. So I have, I've always been teaching um, since I started. And to suddenly not have that is, I feel big lack. And also that for me, that has probably been more detrimental to my writing process than it's been actually not really, it's been as detrimental to my writing process as the pandemic itself, because when you're teaching, you're reading very closely, you're engaged in the idea of discovery, you're sort of pushing, you're seeing some, your students push through and for me consciously, but sometimes unconsciously, they're inspiring you to like sort of push in your own work. And so it's very different and I miss it for sure. I'll go back to it, absolutely. Yeah. So um, a couple of things I'd, I'd like to talk about. I, I know from our discussions uh, before that you are incredible number of drafts and revisions and, and you just hone and polish and rework. So that story you just mentioned, how will you know when you're finished? Is it, is it kind of like you're just ready to abandon it or you really feel like you have it or do you believe you can ever have something completely finished? Or? Um. There's like a pretty particular feeling. I don't know how to describe it, but it, it has to do with me feeling like, you know what? Like for, for usually there's like an aversion and fear of anyone ever seeing something I produce usually for the most part during most of my process. 
And then it gets to a place where it kind of transcends its initial premise, usually for me. And I just, this, that feeling goes to, I really want someone to see this. And that usually means I really feel like it's doing something that has a purpose beyond, look how good a writer I am, you know, beyond not as cool at putting words together. Um, usually it's connected to that feeling and every story is different. So I can't say there's any particular like formula for it, but it's today, like I started working on the thing in this story that I know is that thing for me. And I can't say, you know, like there, there are, I, I think if I, every time I read a story, I'll laugh. Sometimes I, I'll, I'll change it as I'm re reading it. I want to change something. But there's a, I mean, I believe in the power of the line level. So like there is a, but there is a difference between like me put, subbing out a word or two and the heart of a story changing. And it's, it's almost, it's just like a story growing and maturing. And sometimes it takes me to grow and mature to arrive at where the story needs to be. But it's a feeling that, you know what, this should be out there. This is going to do something. This is, this matters beyond me. And um, when I get that, that's when I'm like, you know what, this deserves to, um, this is maybe almost where it needs to get to. <clears throat> I remember, I, I think you had mentioned you were going to experiment with a longer form with a novel. Are you doing that or are you sticking yeah. with the short fiction format? Or? I am doing a novel. That's what I'm supposed to be doing right now. Yeah. But, <laughs> but the stories are what's kind of calling me. So that's what I'm doing. But I am supposed to be working on a novel. I'm pretty far into a novel supposedly how's how's that experience been compared to the length that you're used to writing in it's um it has its own challenges i i think that there's just so much waiting without any shore in sight which is a little bit different than the short story for me um i think that there's a different necessity in terms of planning i don't really outline or draft with my short stories much with the long with the long form, it's starting to seem like you might have I might have to, um, just because in terms of like organization, you know, and it's hard for me to even keep the whole novel in my brain at once because there's so many moving parts, there's so many characters, there's so many different stories, especially the type of novel I tried to write. You know, I didn't <laughs> I didn't do any favors to myself in terms of ease, so um, it's challenging in its own ways, but. There is also a freedom in knowing, you know, I, I have a lot of time to like really break down this world and really, really go in and really, really not give you just the tip of the iceberg, but the whole continent. Do you have a, uh, a great relationship with an editor or an ideal reader yeah. or like a mentor from <laughs> other writers? Um, I mean, I have a couple of people who I really, really respect. But I'm, I would wait to send them stuff. Um, I'll send George my book when it's ready for sure. Um, talking about George Saunders, your yeah. mentor. Yeah. And George Saunders stuff. But for, for my first reader right now has become my agent, Meredith Cafel Simonoff. She's a really, really, really smart reader of my work, a really, really good at sort of, I don't know, finding the truth of the story with me. And that's, and I don't trust a lot of people to read work early. I rarely do it. Um, but my editor at Home Niffin's great. George is great. Mary Carr is a really good reader, and I'll probably try to send her some stories. Uh, a guy named Arthur Flowers, one of my great mentors, is a great reader. I'll send him some stuff. Great. But, uh, my agent is really my first reader right now. So what did it feel like? Because you came uh, right when Friday Black was coming out. I think it yep. had just been the cover review of the New York Times book review that week you were there. Then there was all kinds of buzz and follow-up um did that feel good did it feel like pressure did it did it lead to anything unexpected and wonderful or um yes <laughs> i think um did it feel good sometimes did it feel special for sure did it feel like pressure absolutely unexpected and wonderful yeah i mean my life really changed over the, that last year 2018 till now um i had been on a plane probably one time in my adult life prior to the book. And then at the time I came to Albany in the next couple of months, I, I was on a plane like every single, every week for sure, but maybe every other, every three days. Yeah. Um, I got to 
George actually just sent me a picture of a week ago that this time we were in Australia on a boat for the Sydney Writers Festival. Um, so much has changed. My father was also very sick with cancer. So it was just a very complicated time for me. Um, it was a very sort of difficult, stressful time. Uh, and it, we're, in June, we're going to be a year since he passed. So it was, um, it, was a, it was a really, really overwhelming time for a lot of reasons. I grew for sure. I got, to set, I got to feel like sort of definitively that like, you know, what I had done, what I set out to do in terms of like the book arriving at it at an audience that could appreciate it. I don't think I could have asked for better reception sort of from the literary world and also just like the general public, um, especially for a debut short story collection. Um, so that felt vindicating and it was an honor to just get to be, get to feel like I was in this thing I had been looking on the outside of for so long. Um, and you know, for and, and, and to me going to places like Albany were huge touchstone moments for me because I kind of like, at that time, I was so dedicated and so pressed to have something like that ever happen. When I, was, I mean, when I was in Albany, um, when I was a student there, and to get that, it was kind of a full circle moment. I had got to have several of those in several different spaces. And it felt like um, stepping into a new skin, sort of. It felt like, okay, I've arrived at this space. But then once you arrive there, you also realize there's so much more than getting this. And there's so much more to life than some kind of conception of success or external validation even though for so long i kind of defined myself by the having or not having of that validation so it was a very complicated time but um i i, I try my best to be very grateful for all of it my favorite part of that visit was after your reading an event and like 10 or 12 of your friends and classmates yeah, and most of friends got together on lark street and what it was beautiful was like they were proud of you and things but they just wanted, they, they knew you from before this literary yeah. success and fame and, and, and they loved you because of that. And it was just a beautiful moment. It showed that connection that college can bring these, you know, these forever friends, even though you don't see each other all the time. Yeah. Um, we went, did we go to Bombers? Yeah, it was yeah, Bombers, Bombers, right? Yeah. Um, it was really nice for me uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky that I do have some friends and some of those people that I met in Albany, I knew even before, but I think the ones who were there at that time, almost all of them I met at, not all of them, but the vast, vast majority I met at Albany. Um, and they are my friends forever, you know, and they are, like I see them often outside, like since we graduated and um, they're, they're like my people. And they also don't make it feel so, you know, weird like you get like you, you sometimes you need like they'll still make fun of me they will still joke around like we always do and i don't get that from all the people so many people and so it was a, it was a fun time that was good that was a, that was a good that was a, like a nice time that was one of my favorite parts of it as well that was fun so i wanted to ask you also to to think about and offer some thoughts for the class of 2020 so this is again this pandemic year where unfortunately our graduating seniors will not be able to get to walk across stage to get their diploma. There won't be generations of their family there. And it's really tough in particular, probably 35% of our students are first generation. And it, it, it's such a, a beautiful moment. And now hopefully we can do it in the fall, but we're not sure when it's be rescheduled. First of all, what do you remember uh, at all of, of your graduation? And then what would you say to this class that's going to have something not quite as unique, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, they're going to have the most unique experience in some ways. Right. But I, um, I remember a lot of it. It was a really, really, really nice time for me, actually. I, I, I spoke at the English department graduation. So I got like, that sort of weird pressure my voice was like kind of going at the time so it was, I remember that I'm probably partying too much like the day before that <laughs> um me and my friends we had like a, like the last big party on empire it was really like fun and then um graduation itself was sort of amazing that moment where the confetti explodes you know I think it was the Jabani yogurt guy at ours I can't yeah. remember yeah I think it was uh, um, he did pretty Jamani. well for himself. Yeah, yeah, he did a good job. <laughs> um, 
But it was really just, I just remember being like, you know, with my friends sitting next to each other, like, you know, we did this thing we set out to do. And, and like you said, like almost in the moment, feeling nostalgic for all the memories you create, we created together. Um, it is a special, it's special. But what I'd say to, um, to um, the seniors is it's special because of all that came before it, you know, you got, you have, it's not in and of itself, the graduation is kind of a long, semi boring and kind of tedious thing. You know, um, it's a beautiful moment that I loved, but the event itself, if you go to a random graduation, it won't feel particularly powerful. That's what I'm saying. Right. Um, graduation matters because of the memories you did before, the, the friends you made, because the experience you, you kind of gleaned because of all that stuff. And so that's, what I think you should hold on to as this time comes. And my sort of larger advice that I'm sort of like trying to meditate on or think about is there's some things that we kind of accept as uh, sort of almost written in stone in society or must be the case. Many of us can't imagine all these sports not having a season like they have, for example. I think this time, even though it's very negative, is a great time for us to stretch our imaginations and understand that nothing has to be the way it is. Which we're, which we're discovering kind of forcibly in a sort of traumatic way, forcefully in a tra traumatic way. But also, I think uh, I'm trying to think, it, uh, what we're trying to focus on is things can change. Things can change like that sometimes even. You thought that could never happen, what happened? And it's been happening. And so for us, I think the challenge is, and especially the younger generation, I think they're the best at doing this, is not to accept that this or that must be just because someone told you it has to be. And know that many things that, seem like they're written in stone and society sort of like has the foundation it can leave like that and if that's the case that means so many of these sort of more detrimental evil parts that we sort of know exist we can work on them we can change them we can make things a lot better um because some things are need to improve very dramatically and i think that's if, if there's some hope in this, for me, it comes from understanding it by demonstration that anything can change. Anything can be different. We can really sort of move things how we want. And, um, and that's, empower that's powerful for me. That's great. Thank you for those, uh, those words. And um, I know what you mean. I think sometimes the actual ceremony is more for parents and grandparents and everyone. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, cool, but you know what I mean. It's it's about that feeling of wow, look at where we are together yeah. after all this time. Yeah, and and uh, like you say, all the memories you built beforehand, and probably the party you had before the night before was the most important thing with your. Friend. Yeah, I was pretty good. <laughs> so it's been wonderful, Nan. I appreciate it. I, I, I'm sorry to hear about the passing of your father. I hadn't heard that. I, I oh, hope yeah. your mom makes a, a full and, and complete and speedy recovery and, and good luck with your writing. We follow you. We like to, uh, you know, send shout outs on Twitter and social media love reading yeah. about you. And thanks for being uh, one of the greats. A great. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Um, you know, and for me, uh, a lot of it starts at you Albany. So I'm, Always happy to, uh, I don't know, I rep you Albany pretty hard as much as I can. And and not just because um, it's where I went, but like some of the things you just said, look at the percentage that is first generation and the percentage that, um, you know, might come from a low income background, the percentage that's of color. It's a, it's, a, it's a space where a lot of, I've been in other academic spaces that are nothing like it, let's just say. And so, um, you know, for me, it matters to really let people know, like, you know, you're from a place that is just as valid, just as good, just as um, potentially powerful as any of the other institutions. And so I look forward to hopefully getting a chance to um, support in any other way in the future. Excellent. And if you come back to Albany, I hope we can go to Bombers again and get some of those wings and tacos. And yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm always down. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, whenever the invite comes, I'll try my best to make my way. Excellent. All right, Nana. Be safe and be healthy. Thanks for joining the conversation. Of course. Have a good one, all right? You too. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.